Thanks very much. Um, I guess uh, this is quite a wide topic, <laughs> decolonizing global health. But um, can I just maybe start by asking how many philosophers do we have uh, in this room? <laughs> okay, good. So um, I said, okay, that's fine. Because sometimes, I mean, when I listen to presentations, especially in the sciences, I struggle to follow all the courses and I say, well, I should have learned more Greek just to be able to follow. But this, this, I mean, this presentation is going to be a little bit sort of like high level philosophical concepts. So let's see whether we can get through it quickly. And then if there are questions, we can take a look at them. Is this the way to go? <laughs> okay. So I start off by saying decolonization is now becoming buzzword. Everywhere, I mean, in academia, especially in the high income countries, there are many networks of people trying to decolonize. So, decolonization is becoming one of the in words. From time to time in academia, some words become very fashionable and they become almost like a movement. And I think this is the moment of decolonization. But then, decolonization, in my opinion, is a bit of a mongrel concept. And I borrow the concept, mongrel concept from philosophy of mind, where we talk about mongrel concepts as something that brings together a series of experiences. Yeah. And there isn't one single one that is actually the essence or, I mean, that is like the purebred concept of decolonization. Because people experience colonization in different ways, in different places, and from different positions. But then, if we're going to talk about decolonization, at least there must be something wrong with colonization in order to decolonize. <laughs> right? There might be something wrong with it. So let's see. I mean, what is the specific moral wrong of colonization? What is wrong with colonization anyway? Why should we decolonize? Any answers? It wasn't co-produced. It wasn't co-produced. <laughs> Well, um, what if we say some, some of the indigenous people actually participated in colonizing their own people? That's co-production. <laughs> sorry, I'm being, I'm being, I'm being I'm something provocative, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Autonomy. Yeah. Yeah, autos nomos, right? Giving laws to yourself. So that's what was taken away by colonization. Well, that's, 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 that's possible. But is taking away auto, um, autonomy, does it happen only in colonization? Coloniz I mean, through colonization? So would we call that a specific evil of colonization? Yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Imposing somebody else's standards on Imposing somebody else's standards on Yeah, that's true. I mean, all the things that have been said, just to be brief, they're all right. But that's why it's a mongrel concept. Because there are so many, I mean, you know, I mean, the mongrels are they, like, they breeds that bring in different species, right? So all these things are there. Um, you can have the, you know, extraction of natural resources, imposing forms of government, racism, all these things are within this mix of colonization. But, these, but there is a specific moral wrong which we need to identify in order to be able to decolonize. Um, so let me ask the second question. Is it possible to have a good colonization or a good colonizer, a nice guy? <laughs> Imagine my English as a <laughs> A good colonizer. I don't think there's good colonization, but I think that the colonization process may bring in some improvements in the settings that are necessary. So, for example, Maybe set up a health system for colonies, which ends up being 
Okay, so yeah, I mean, they can be activities that improve people's well-being, but colonization in itself cannot be cannot be a good thing, right? I think I mean. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is to see whether we can talk about um, what I consider to be the specific moral wrong with colonization. Colonization subtracts, it's the act of subtraction of the self-determining agency of communities and peoples. Um, even if we go back to the Roman times, the colonus of the Romans was basically an idea of sending Roman citizens to occupy territories outside Rome and transform those territories into areas that serve the interests of Rome. So in doing so, what you do is that you actually subtract the agency of a people to self-determine the political agency of self-determination. But it's not only the subtraction. If it were the subtraction, that would be one step. But along with the subtraction comes a substitution. <laughs> and the substitution becomes a way of creating structures that ensure that the agency of those people becomes I mean, an agency that serves the interests of the colonizer. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you create a structure, a system. Mm -hmm. And you have a center and a periphery. And the periphery is always to some extent, working towards the interests of the center. And that is how you build a system um, <clears throat> that is today we call it coloniality, which doesn't, it doesn't really need the former colonizers, but it only, it only needs centers and peripheries. And those centers, which were London, Paris, today can be Abuja, Nairobi, Accra, Lagos and it's coloniality that is continuing. Now, <clears throat> these structures operate along three lines. One is epistemicide, which is the intentional misrecognition of certain forms of knowledge. And therefore, only certain centers and certain types of knowledge are legitimate. I'll give you an example. Um, two weeks ago, we were in Lisbon with the National Ethics Committees of 90 different countries meeting under the UNESCO. So we decided to have a regional meeting. I called all the African um, <laughs> National Ethics Committees that works with the standards boards and the FDAs. And we sat down and I asked them a question. I said, gentlemen, um, when a traditional medicine is brought to you, to, accept, to test. What is the first test that you do? They all responded a toxicology test. And I said, okay, let's stop and take one step back. Is medicine poison? Why do you start with the toxicology test? That is already a way of uttering that form of knowledge because you, you're already starting with the assumption that this is impure. And therefore the first thing you have to test for is if it is poisonous. Why don't you test for what it can do first? These are forms of epistemicide. And anyway, I could. How many more minutes? Right? <laughs> 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 I just want to make sure that you. So, and then, of course, along with the epistemicide um, and centers like the University of Oxford are also centers that promote this form of epistemicide. Um, because, like I, I mean, I said this once in the conference, my philosophy students in Ghana know more about English and European philosophers than philosophers in Oxford know about African philosophers. <laughs> um, but that's, that's systemic. Now, we also have ecocide. I'm not going to go into how we've transformed the former colonies or even these colonies into extractive uh, country, uh, countries that live on extracting resources. Up to now, many African countries are 50 years from independence. The only thing we do is how to sell our natural resources. So we just have to sell the environment. And that's how we believe we can develop because that's the model. 
We can talk about genocide linked with race and even the, the whole history of racism. I mean, racism is actually invented to justify the system historically. So we, this now leads to these systems of coloniality. But since I mean, I wasn't asked to talk about I mean, decolonization in abstract, but about decolonization and global health. Now let's just take this definition that is often used, one of the most cited definitions of global health from Copland, which says that it is an area um, of study, research, and practice that places priority on improving health and achieving equity in health for all people worldwide. You see, this is a beautiful idea. The, the problem is, uh, how are we going to go about it? On which structures are we going to rely to achieve this equity <laughs> for everybody? If we rely on the existing structures, then we are actually reinforcing colon colonization or coloniality. And that is why in the process of actually trying to achieve the goals of global health, we need to decolonize. Otherwise, global health can't actually become a vehicle to consolidate these, these structures that exist. And um, yeah, I mean, time is running out, but uh, you know, there are different obligations that arise from, um, that arise different obligations in, in decolonization, depending on where we sit. But I just want to talk about these two, uh, and then we'll maybe we'll stop there. One is this idea of de-imperialization. De-imperialization simply means that, I mean, and this is the onus that is on the former colonizers. Um, you know, you don't have to solve the world's problems and go and solve them yourself. Allow the principle of subsidiarity to work. There are existing structures in places. Allow them to work. And this is what calls for forms of abolitionism. Abolitionism is to stop doing what you've always done. Um, I could give many examples, but I'm, I'm going to leave it at that for now. Then we have the epistemic um, and practical pluriversality. Pluriversality is borrowed from the Zapatista movement in uh, Chiapas. Um, un mundo donde quepan muchos mundos, a world in which many worlds can fit together. One of the problems of colonization is universalization. So it's just one way, but it's possible to have pluriversalization. However, pluriversalization means we have to learn how to live in a world of reason disagreements. Reason disagreements mean we do not have to agree conceptually on everything, but we can agree on shared goals and work towards these shared goals. I think I'm running, I've, I've abused my time, so I'll just stop here. There is a decolonization network, even within the Department of uh, <laughs> the Napa Department of Medicine, uh, led by Sassy. Uh, she just, we just, I mean, uh, Sassy speak, and some of us are part of it, and some colleagues in. Australia, um, Kenya, and other parts. And if you want to read more about it, there's some stuff that we've written. And then, of course, there are the classes that go back to Fanon, Nkrumah, um, Walter Rodney, that can really be really interested in this literature. Thank you.